Good morning. It's good to see everybody this morning. We're glad that you're here and excited that you're with us. If you're visiting with us, we're especially glad you're here. I want you to come back at each and every time you can to be with us and to um, worship God, and we would love to get to know you better. So please stick around a while after services. You recognize some of these people? Um, as you know, you probably don't need to be told, this is us, or at least a good bit of us that were there that one day. Um, last Sunday, Andy had a lesson on becoming a member of the church and becoming a member of God's church. And, and I, I thought it was an especially good lesson. And immediately after hearing his lesson out in the foyer, as we were just getting ready to dismiss services, I said to Andy, I said, uh, are you doing a lesson on the, the benefits of being a member of the church? And he said, well, no, that's not, a, not in the series. I said, well, I'm going to do one. And especially after hearing Sunday night's lesson, if you remember Sunday night's lesson, it was the video that we watched on church attendance and the significance of it. And I thought that that, that, that was very good and very applicable to what, what Andy had said on Sunday morning and fit very well with what I wanted to do also. When you look at this picture and you look there, that picture, that, that's the Berryfield Church of Christ not that brick building that's behind it, what's in front of it. That's, that's the congregation. That's the church. If this building were to fall to the ground this afternoon, hopefully when none of us was here, but if this building were to fall to the ground, we would still be the Barrickville Church of Christ, wouldn't we? As the people, we would still be that. You know, many of you heard that the Gatlinburg uh, congregation in Gatlinburg, Tennessee, their building burnt to the ground back um, here in, a few months ago when they had the forest fires there in the Great Smoky Mountains. But the Gatlinburg Church of Christ is alive and well, same as it's always been, and just as strong as it's always been. And here in a few months or a year, I think they're going to have a new building. Didn't burn down the church, burnt down the, the building. And not coming into the building, but being a part of the church, being a part of the family, it is important. It has great benefits. This morning, I want to look at a short list. Because quite honestly, if you were to list all the things that are beneficial about being a part of the Lord's church, being a part of God's people, we could be here all day and night. And, and not get to them all. But I want to look at a short list of what I think are some of the most significant things that are important about being members of uh, the Lord's Church. You know, there's the credit card commercial that you hear. Uh, membership has its privileges. And the and I kind of think of that, you know, that idea of because we are a part of the church, because we're part of God's people, think about some of the privileges, some of the benefits that, that we get to be a part of. And so if you haven't already done so, please turn to Romans chapter 8. And I want us to look at this text. Romans chapter 8 has a lot in the chapter. A lot of things there that we're not going to, uh, to deal with uh, even in our, in our time today. Uh, we just don't have the time to deal with all of it because there is so much that is there. But... Um, it's a, a powerful, powerful text. The text that Stephen read to us a little bit ago, starting in verse 12, um, is, is one that uh, I think especially relates to those blessings that we have, those benefits that we have in, uh, in Christ. Let's look in uh, verse 12 and following. We'll read the text again that, that we have there. It says, So then, brothers, we are debtors. Not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, 
but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may be glorified with him. When we look at this text, this text and the, the surrounding chapter are chock full of things that show us benefits that we find in Christ. I want you to notice the first one that, that I have selected for us, that when we, we become Christians, we become a part of God's family, he says to us that, that what kind of spirit do we see, receive? It's not a spirit of slavery. We're not brought into bondage. But instead, what are we brought in to be? He says the spirit then is, is not a slavery that we fall back into fear, but the receive the spirit of adoption. Adoption is a beautiful and wonderful word. You know what it really means? It means somebody was wanted. It means somebody was chosen. It was decided that someone pulled them in, that they were chosen. In the spiritual sense, in this text sense, we're adopted into God's family. You know, being adopted is a good thing, but it's even more significant as to who you're adopted by. Not, not all people doing the adopting are, are, are the same. It'd be better to be adopted by some as opposed to others, wouldn't you say? Yeah, and who you get adopted by is important. Who has adopted us? Who has brought us into their family? Well, it's the Almighty God. You know, if you want to be chosen by a family, if you want to be picked by someone, the best of all to be chosen by is God. You know, we've not been brought into this family to be, to be brought in as slaves, but instead we are brought in adopted as sons. You see... God has chosen us. God has picked us as his children. What a wonderful thing it is to be wanted. What a, what a fantastic thing it is to be wanted by the almighty God. And we have been adopted into his family. You see, we weren't originally a part of God's family. We, we weren't immediately a part of his family. You know, especially the book of Romans written to a Gentile audience. The majority of them were Gentiles. They weren't a part of the, 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 the chosen people of the Old Testament. They were, they were separate from God in the same way we are. But yet, God has chosen us. God has wanted us to be a part of his family. And so we get adopted in. Second of all, not only adopted into the family, we're adopted into a royal family. We're adopted as to become sons of the king. You look at this, this text, and, and he says in verse um, 17 that not only are we adopted, we're made, we're made children. We're children of God. You know, we think about that term, we throw that term around a lot, but do we ever really think about the significance of what that means? To be a child of God. You ever think about the importance of being a son or a daughter of your parents? Does that mean something? Your parents? They're, 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 what, who they are and what they stand for? You know, I've always been thankful for my family. Thankful for my parents, my grandparents, where I, where I come from. Because I knew that, you know, they're good people, God-fearing people. People that love the Lord and raised me to also be that way. That may or may not be your situation. But certainly, who you are part of your family has significance for who you are and where you've come from. As good as that all is, that really pales in comparison to being a part of God's family and what it means to be a member of his family, being a member of his royal family. 
you know, I, I watched um, the inauguration on Friday, and I imagine a, a fair amount of you did as well. Um, now, I didn't watch the, the four hours of talking about the inauguration before it happened and the, the uh, 72 hours of coverage since, uh, I, but I watched the inauguration itself because uh, what the pundits say about it before and after I could deal without. But you look at that and you see the family come in of, of, the, of the current president and the family and close associates of the former president and you realize, you know, what it means to be married or, or uh, related to or a part of that family. Whether you like it or not, obviously it's a place of honor to be there and to be a part of such an occasion. As good as that would be, that's nothing next to what it means to be a child of the Almighty God. You see, when we think about it, it's always, it's always important to go home. It's always good to go home, isn't it? Or at least hopefully it is. I know not everybody has the same experiences. Um, as you know, uh, Marion County, West Virginia is my home. You know, um, I've spent the majority of my adult life elsewhere, but the couple times a year, it was always nice to get to come back home to see how the area looked and the things that are here and maybe every now and then, occasionally a thing that changes that is different. But it's always good to be home, and I think we recognize that. And if you've ever been away from home or ever away from your home, it's always good to be back at that. Why? Because that's where you're familiar. That's where you recognize. It's always great to be with the family. When we breathe our last and we leave this life, we will get to go to our eternal home. You see, as a Christian, this isn't our home. But what we have is the hope and the prospect of something infinitely better that we get to go to. We are members of the royal family. We're a member of God's family, and we get to be with Him. We get to go home to be with Him forever. You notice... Because we are a part of the family, because we are children, who are the heirs to the estate, to the inheritance? Now, it's not that God's going to die, but that God has an inheritance for those that are his family. We get to be a part of that inheritance. You look at there, who's named in the inheritance in, in, um, in the text there in verse uh, 16. It says, the Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we're children of God. Because we're children, He says in verse 17, If children, then heirs. If we're children, we're heirs. Heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. We're a fellow heir with Christ. Heirs of God and heirs with Jesus. You know, Every now and then you'll find something on the news, you'll see it on there, and you'll hear about some massive estate, and you'll hear about the dollar amount that the heirs of that estate are going to collect. And you think, wow, wouldn't it have been nice to have been a relative of so-and-so? Well, you think about the Almighty God and the estate, the inheritance. Heaven itself, that we will be an heir of, and a co-heir, a joint heir with Christ. You think about the great blessings of that. That's far infinitely greater than anything that we might ever begin to inherit here on earth. And so much better with that. Being a member of, of that, of the internal inheritance, has such great and valuable benefits. Also in, in, in Romans chapter 8, we find out that our Lord and Savior, and, and there's more things in here, um, skip over to verse uh, 34. You know, in the verses directly preceding that, in verse 31, it says, If God is for, for us, who can be against us? 
And then he says, who can separate us? Uh, you know, that God has, did not spare his own son and gave him for us. And then verse 34 says, who is to condemn? In other words, who is there out there that could condemn, could condemn us for, for who we are? And then it says, Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised. Who is at the right hand of God? Who indeed is interceding for us? Who is there out there that is so righteous and worthy that is in a place that they could condemn you and me? And that is Jesus. He's the one that can condemn us. But in the scheme of things, Christ is the one that justifies us. Do you realize? That as Christians, our prosecuting attorney, the one that could condemn us, is also our defender. Now that would never work in a, in a court of law for us. But what a great thing that is. The only one that has the right power and authority to condemn is the one that has justified. The one that has forgiven. The one that gave his life for us. You know what? That's not fair, but it's purposefully unfair in a way because when I stand before God, I don't want fairness. <laughs> I want grace and mercy. It would never work in, in our legal system for the prosecuting attorney and the defense attorney to be the same individual. That would never work. But it works because the Almighty God the only one that can condemn is the one that justifies. And what a great thing that is. It is all completely in our favor. Who is it that mediates for us? Who is it that, that is there for us? It is Jesus. He is at the right hand of God interceding for us. This is a thing that we've seen again and again in the book of Hebrews. In Hebrews chapter 4, he says that we have a high priest who is at the right hand of God, who is there interceding for us. We have Jesus as our mediator. He goes before God on our behalf. We'll never be forgotten. We'll never be neglected. We'll never be cast aside. What a great blessing that is because we're a member of the body of Christ. We have Jesus to plead our case. You know, we've all seen it happen. Someone gets accused of a crime and they get a good lawyer. And they get off from the crime and they maybe shouldn't have. But because they had a really good lawyer, well, we stand before God and you know what we've got if we're, if we're a Christian? We've got the best lawyer possible. We've got the best defense possible. We've got Jesus, our mediator who's there on our behalf. We have the Holy Spirit as our intercessor. We have him interceding for us. Let's look at verse 26 of the same chapter. You know, we, we see in our text, in our, in our main text of 12 through 17, we see that we have a spirit from God. We have a spirit not of slavery, but a spirit of adoption. And that further telling us about our, the spirit, and how the Spirit helps us. Look in verse 26. He says, Likewise the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what we ought to pray. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And I look at that text and I have people sometimes ask, you know, this would be another really good question. We've been talking about doing questions next Sunday night. This would be another really good question. I'm going to go ahead and answer it, so don't put it in the list. But, but here's a really good question. How does the, the Holy Spirit intercede for us in ways that words can't express? And my answer is, I don't know. Because words can't express it. Right? By, by definition, it's almost un understandable, misunderstandable. We, we don't quite get it. Well, but what we do understand about it is this. The Holy Spirit is able and does intercede for us in ways that we aren't even able to comprehend. 
In other words, the Holy Spirit is able to represent us again in, in a similar way to what Christ does, intercede for us when we don't even understand. You see, the representation we have before God is our Lord and Savior and God's Spirit. They are able to do their job better than we can do it ourselves. We not only get adequately represented before God, but our representation before God is even better than what we can even comprehend. And so we have, as members of God's family, we're able to be a part of this family, we're able to be a part of this royal family, that we're children of the king. We have this great inheritance from God. We have our Lord and Savior as our mediator. We have the Spirit of God as our intercessor. We will never be misrepresented. We will never be forgotten. We'll never be lost. We'll never be cast aside. And what a great thing that is. And as the result of that, we have such a wonderful situation. And we have what I bring to the last thing that results. And like I said, there's many other things that we can look about, about the membership that we have in Christ and the benefits of it. But let's look in verse 23. Verse 23, chapter 8, it says, And not only the creation, but we ourselves, the fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly, grown inwardly as... We wait eagerly for adoption as sons. Further about the adoption that we've talked. We're, we're look, looking for this. He says, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope, we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience we have the hope of heaven because we're a part of the family we have the blessings that come by being a part of the family we have the help that comes from Christ we have the help that comes from God's spirit and this ultimately will be fulfilled in the hope that we have of heaven what a wonderful and great blessing that is what a great thing to think that this isn't the end, but yet this is the beginning. That we have the anticipation of what is beyond. But I want to tell you, as great as all of this is, and as wonderful as all of this is, if you're not a member of God's family, none of this applies to you. It's only when you become a part of God's family, only when you've been adopted into the family, only then you become an heir, only then you have the Spirit to intercede for you, only then do you have Christ as your mediator, only then do you have the hope of heaven. But you have a choice. You can change that. If that's not your current reality, you can change that. You can come and become a child of God. God has given us His plan of how we can become a part of his family. These are basically what Andy looked at last week. Some of these texts are the, the things in his lesson about becoming a member and the things along with membership. And I have some of those listed up there. The plan that God has for us and some of the things that he wants us to do and, the, and, and some of the texts that go with them. It's not an exhaustive list by any means, but it is a representation of what the Bible tells us about what it means to believe and repent and confess and be baptized. Those things are what we are to do in order to be washed of our sins, to be forgiven of what we've done wrong, to be a part of God's family, to become a Christian, to be a part of this that we've been looking at today. And when we do that, it's not an end, but yet it's a beginning. It is then that we become a Christian. It's then that we are to live a faithful life, a life in which we stay true to God and true as a part of his family from then on. And we get to here and now enjoy the benefits 
of being a member, but ultimately the greatest of all benefits comes when we're gone from this life and we live with God for eternity. You know, heaven, heaven is so great, so wonderful, and the opportunity and the hope of it is so powerful that why would we want to take the opportunity to miss it? Why would we ever want to do anything to keep us from being there? Why wouldn't we want to do everything we could and make every effort that we could to be right with God to be able to be a part of that? And being a member of His family and the blessings that come with that are all a big part of that. This last Sunday night we had a lesson on attendance. And, and I thought it was very good. And, and if you weren't able to catch either of those, you can uh, you can get the Andy's lesson on Sunday morning on on uh, becoming a member of the church. It's on our YouTube channel, I think, isn't it? Yeah, it's on the YouTube channel. Did we put Sunday nights on there too? Okay, but we can get you the the lesson from Sunday night. You can get it, I think, on World Video Bible School, or you can get it. We we have access to the the, the, the uh, video. It is also something I'd highly recommend. But when you think about being a member of the church, you think about the value of attendance and, and what it all means. It's like this. Do you want to be in heaven? Is that what you really want? I mean, a- after all, isn't that what we all want? Does anybody not want to be in heaven? Okay. Okay. Who's going to be in heaven? Who's going to be in heaven? Well, we know God's there. We know Jesus is there. We know the angels are there. Who else is going to be in heaven? God's people. Who are the people that are in the church? The kingdom of God here on earth. God's people. Well, here's what I want to tell you. If you don't want to be around God's people, then heaven might not be the place for you. Because... If it's a chore to spend a few hours a week with God's people, then heaven's going to be miserable to you. Now, I say all that tongue-in-cheek, but I want you to recognize that who are we going to spend eternity with? And if it's God's people, then by all means, the closest taste what heaven is going to be like is the time that we get to spend here with the people that we are going to spend eternity with. Not the people in the world, but the people that we spend in church. And so that's kind of my comment on attendance. Why would you not want to spend every moment that you have an opportunity with the people that you're going to spend eternity with. Because when you really think about it, if you don't want to be around God's people, then why are you going to heaven? If you today are not right with God, not ready to become one of His children, or not one of His children, we want to sing this invitation song to encourage you to become a child of God and go through the, the things that we have listed up there. If you want to study about those or talk about those, we'd be glad to do that. If you are a Christian, and that, that bottom section down there about living a faithful life, you've been struggling with that in one way or another, and, and we want to pray with you and for you and help you. You know, we, we view this front row that when somebody comes down there, that, that their life is a mess and, and they've done something horribly wrong, and, that, and it shouldn't be that way. It could be the case, instead of the front row being the loneliest place, you know it ought to be the place that we find grace and mercy. It ought to be the place that we find help, the place that we find encouragement, the place that we find love from our brothers and sisters. You see, whatever it is that you're struggling with, you need prayers for or help with, we want you to come. And if we can help you, Have you a heart that's weary, tending a load of care? Are you a soul that's seeking rest from the burdens you bear? Do you know 
Closing hymn will be 111, Come We That Love the Lord. After we sing the first verse of this song, uh, Brother Mark Stutler will close our service in prayer. 111. <clears throat> Come we that love the Lord, and let our joys be known. Join in a song with sweet accord. Join in a song with sweet 